Kirchner for Monday, January 15, 2018. I'd ask everyone in attendance to rise and join us in singing O Canada. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you to the National Film Board for the images of our country and to uh, a alumni of our Grand Prairie Boys Choir for the audio. Uh, we'll move on to the adoption of the previous council meeting minutes. Can I have a motion for the adoption of that set of minutes? Councillor Pallott. I would recommend that council approve the minutes of the city council meeting held Monday, December 18th, 2007 as presented. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Pallott. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, and then I need a motion for the adoption of the agenda. Councillor O'Toole. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, if there's no other additions to the agenda. I move the council adopt the agenda as presented. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate uh, as to the agenda? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. I think I'm looking for one more. Council, just make sure it registered. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, this brings us to the delegation portion of our agenda. This is an opportunity that we have at every regular city council meeting for anyone to come forward and address council on any community-related matter, so long as it isn't the subject of a public hearing. Um, was there anybody here that wished to make a presentation to council in the delegation portion of our agenda? I don't see anybody rushing the stage, so to speak, and there may be some people here to speak to the public hearings, um, but I don't see anybody coming forward, so I'll just leave that reminder that this opportunity does exist at every regular city council meeting. Uh, we'll move on from the delegation portion of our agenda into public hearings, and we'll start off with item 6.1, the Hughes Lake Area Structure Plan. I'd call this public hearing to order and look to administration for an introduction. Thank you, Mayor Given. Administration has initiated the process to adopt an area structure plan for the Hughes Lake Area. Uh, tonight we are recommending that Council give bylaw C-1367, which is the Hughes Lake Area Structure Plan, first and second readings. Um, the Hughes Lake Area Structure Plan consists of approximately 19 quarter sections, west, north, west, and southwest of the airport. Uh, the land was annexed into the city in 2016, and Alberta Transportation is currently in the process of constructing Highway 43X along what is largely the west boundary of the plan area. At this time, uh, the County of Grand Prairie has initiated the dispute resolution identified in the Intermunicipal Development Plan with respect to this ASP. At this stage in the dispute resolution process, the City can only, can only proceed to second reading. Uh, additional dispute resolution steps are required before Council can, can consider giving this bylaw third reading. The Hughes Lake Area Structure Plan is located at the west end of the City and is bounded by 43X in the west and north, to the south by Highway 43. and. Uh, the Grand Prairie Airport to the east is shown on this map. Uh, the majority of the area is currently in uh, agricultural production. Uh, the area that we identified for the adoption of this area structure plan was largely because that we thought that with the construction of Highway 43X, this area was probably the the uh, the annexed area that was probably uh, would, would see the most immediate development pressure and therefore we, we initiated, the, initiated the area structure plan process for this. So the an area structure plan is a high level document in the planning process. It provides the land uses and the servicing plans for large areas and it must conform with the city's intermunicipal development plan and the municipal development plan. 
The framework is provided in this plan that will be used by developers to provide more detailed plans such as outline plans and at that stage they will prepare design reports to do the development and subdivision. The area structure plan will show land uses for the residential, commercial and industrial as well as the park space and environmental reserve. As well, these plans showed the general servicing of the water and sewer, the stormwater management and the road systems. The Hughes Lake Area Structure Plan process began in October of 2016. At that point, we engaged a consultant to ISL Engineering to, to do the project for the city. They prepared a background report and did three stages of engagement with the landowners and with the public. The first stage was the discovery and visioning that took place in November 2016. A landowner workshop and public open house was held to gather potential opportunities and challenges to shape the vision of the area structure plan. Approximately 55 residents took place at this stage. After that was done, the landowners or the consultant and the city worked together to develop a draft plan. Two drafts, actually, two choices. And in March 2017, a landowner workshop and public open house was held to gather feedback on these two alternative development concepts that were based on the vision and the guiding principles developed by the public input and the technical review that was done along the way. Approximately 30 partic people participated at this open house and workshop. And after this, the preferred plan was refined and a draft area structure plan was developed to be again reviewed. And in September, two more open houses were held to gather feedback on this draft plan. The first section was a session was a landowner open house held at the Bible Believers Church and 13 landowners attended. And a public open house was held after that. There's more information about the process in the area structure plan as well as in the city's report. Uh, the plan was based on uh, several key considerations that were developed right out of the gate uh, in the initial landowner engagement round. Uh, basically, the key considerations were to define the location and form of future industrial and commercial development. Uh, the plan was designed to support the city's overall growth and annexation strategy. The uh, key uh, strategic rationale behind the annexation was to increase the city's commercial and industrial land, land base, and so this uh, plan is designed to help uh, achieve that, that strategic goal. Uh, in terms of the plan itself, protection of trumpeter swan habitat was of utmost concern because Hughes Lake is a defined trumpeter swan habitat, as is the neighboring uh, Hermit Lake and also Bear Lake. Um, preservation of natural areas and wetlands, Highway 43X, both the access to it and the impacts of the highway, which uh, borders the plan area to the north and west, were significant issues. We also considered compatibility and integration with the airport. Because of its location uh, and its relative to existing services, we also spent some effort to discuss and review interim servicing strategies and also uh, more rural standards, for example, with the de in the de development of roadways in the future. Uh, we had to consider compatibility with existing country residential development. We reviewed issues relating to the fact that this is area is subject to high visibility corridors with 100th Avenue and Highway 43X, and also to help uh, through the design process later on, uh, we developed a uh, series of design guidelines to support the ASP. Overall, the project deliverables not only included specifically the area structure plan document itself, but the design guideline. We also did a phase one environmental site assessment at the outset of the project. Uh, we had a subconsultant engage, engaged to undertake an industrial opportunities report to give us an idea of what kind of industrial development could conceivably occur in this area and the amount. And also uh, the, uh, the background technical report that we under, undertook. So it's not just the area structure plan that was the the work that was done in support of this project. There was a lot of uh, background work uh, leading into this plan. Based on the um, configuration of the plan area and the circumstances within the plan area, it's a large area of about 19 quarter sections. Uh, all of, and basically there were three, we developed over time the fact that there were essentially three sub areas within this plan. 
Um, the northerly most, uh, about nine quarter sections, it has been termed the Lake Eco Industrial Area. And this is an area foreseen for primarily industrial business and office parks, kind of low impact development compat with a lot of environmental compatibility, promoting green space. It's not a conventional industrial park concept in this area. Um, the airport west, which is the central area immediately west of the airport. Uh, this is a, a more conventional industrial area that you would see, for example, in the Mount View area to the southeast, as an example, uh, where their uh, development's compatible with the airport, focus on intermodal and logistic kinds of uses, and also there's height limits because of the, uh, the proximity to the airport. And then Highway 43 South is a bit of a remnant piece. It's severed from the rest of the plan area by a Highway 43 or 100th Avenue, and because of its proximity to the highway and its relative isolation, we see this as being more conventional, large to medium industrial uses. But there has to be some consideration of design controls because it is a gateway area to the city. So we wanted to pursue a gateway image there. In terms of the overall land use concept, there's a range of industrial and commercial opportunities. For your frame of reference on the map, the uh, purple is general, general industrial development, the red is commercial development, the blue is industrial business or office park development, and green is uh, open space, uh, and the yellow is existing country residential. We were very considerate of ex compatibility with existing residential uses. We focused on the integration of amenities, uh, pedestrian connections, and natural features. There's the strategic use of open space. Uh, it is predominantly industrial area, so we're not gonna see a lot of green space, but it is important, it, particularly in the north end and proximity to Hughes Lake and other wetlands, that there is more of a green space allotment than you might see in a conventional industrial or commercial context. We were considered of connections and synergies with the highway network and the airport, and also, as mentioned, gateways and high visibility corridors. We wanted to promote a high aesthetic standard in the area. Zooming in a little bit um, with the, the uh, Lake Eco Industrial Area, overall in the plan area and speaking to open space, um, there's approximately a 60-40 split between uh, land or MR dedicated as land versus cash in lieu. Uh, it's very much a balance. In this area, the major, um, a large majority of the MR owing is proposed to be allocated as land, both in terms of buffering around the lake and the wetlands, but also to provide the possibility for a large regional park space, which is in the southeast corner of this area. This is an area which would be prominently for office park and commercial nodes for that would serve adjacent neighborhoods. It's the, a key entry point to the city off of Highway 43X. And also uh, it's designed in such a way, for example, the stormwater management pond system around Hughes Lake to help buffer the shoreline and preserve shoreline habitat. In Airport West, uh, zooming in a bit, this is, as I mentioned, conventional uh, uh, general industrial development. There's a large commercial node in the southwest, which we see as sort of a big box opportunity, another power, potentially another power center uh, because of its location near the airport, and a smaller commercial node more central uh, around a key, which will be a key intersection between two arterial road, future arterial roadways. In Highway 43 South, uh, there are, as mentioned, there are limited opportunities due to access and topography. There's a, some pretty significant slopes in this area. So really we're, what we're looking at is long-term is uh, larger scale industrial development that's, that's pretty well reflective of the development around that area currently. I will point out to council that there is an error on the map that we need to, rip, to fix, which would be we would uh, submit a change prior to this plan going forward for third reading where there's a, uh, a white band along the south boundary of this plan area that should in fact be a green space. Uh, we, need, we moved a roadway but forgot to change the color, so we will in fact do that. We didn't pick that up until actually we were putting this presentation together. This is the, the overall open space concept for the plan. 
it uh, shows future pedestrian connections. It also focuses or, or shows more emphasis where the uh, parks and open spaces will be. Uh, we focus on pedestrian con connectivity, lakeshore buffers, also buffers around individual country residential properties and natural areas. It's also important to note that there are existing country residential lots in this area. What we foresee in the plan is that as development occurs, there is no new residential development proposed, but as the area develops, and these are opportunities um, for these areas or these lots to be converted to industrial use down the road, and that would be a dealt with in individual outline plans going forward. But that change could would occur without an amendment require, being required to this area structure plan. The transportation network is is focused on Highway 43X, where we illustrate future access opportunities. There are really only two that are currently approved by Alberta Transportation, and that is at the north end, at what will ultimately tie into uh, 132nd Avenue, and at the uh, 116th Avenue, uh, just north of the major interchange. We're showing on the map at the center where the yellow, or sorry, the or orange, the red circle uh, is shown. We're showing that as a potential access opportunity to the highway. That has not been approved by Alberta Transportation, uh, but Alberta Transportation basically said, if in the future that uh, an access can be shown to not interfere with future highway operations, that it could be considered, but they would not be investing in any highway improvements at this location. So if an access were to happen at this, state, at this location, it would be, uh, at the city's expense. Presumably you paid through by levies and so on. So it is shown as an opportunity, um, but it's um, not certain that it would actually that it would actually be constructed. We also show in the plan long-term uh, water and sanitary sewer networks. These are these are all shown as ultimate. Uh, the plan does also talk about, however, interim servicing strategies because it's gonna be some time before water and sewer uh, services are extended to this area because that will all be, all be de developer driven. And the stormwater management system has been primarily based on existing master plans, although we have modified it a bit um, to more suit the area. Uh, the focus being um, uh, stormwater retention around Hughes Lake and uh, other locations uh, showing, so we're illustrating the drainage basins there. Lastly, supporting the, uh, the plan are the, is the design guidelines. Um, these are principles for site development, amenities, and also roadway development. These are not intended to replace bylaw standards or land use bylaw standards or other city design guidelines that are currently in place. This is intended to augment them. Uh, more for the visual impact of the development and the appearance of the of developments in the area. There's also a recommendations and suggestions for green guidelines, low impact development, that kind of thing. Uh, there's sample illustrations of what gateway areas could look like, streetscape character, suggestions on building massing and form, and also treatment of environmentally sensitive areas. So in, in summary, uh, your worship, the ASP addresses the long-term industrial commercial uh, growth needs of the city over the long term. There's emphasis on environmental protection and the preservation and integration of natural areas, opportunities for interim servicing strategies and rural road development standards. Uh, the plan supports Highway 43X and airport synergies. There's a lot of opportunities for intermodal and other transportation connectivity. We have an appropriate allocation in our view of park space between land and uh, money in lieu. There's been, been an extensive community engagement process and I would argue that we've been relatively successful considering there's, there isn't a room full of people here tonight. And administration as uh, Dan indicated in his report, administration are recommending uh, at least going to second reading tonight. So we'd be pleased to answer any questions that council may have. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. McRae. Um, before we move to any presentations or submissions, Council, any questions for the uh, admin team at this point? Councillor Thiessen. Wow, I, I looked over. I thought Clyde beat me to the punch. Thanks, uh, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, thanks for that presentation, and thank you to administration for all the, uh, the, the great work that got put in here as part of that consultation. And uh, it was very thorough, and uh, 
you know, at, uh, sometimes you go to some consultations and it's like we're not listening to people, but we were literally listening to people, and you can see that. So thank you for that. I, I did notice some things, and I wanted to uh, ask. I have a whole list of questions, so I'm going to ask two, and then I'm going to pass the queue, and then if the, the rest don't get asked later. Um, my first question is uh, in regards to the setbacks from the lake. Now, uh, in the plan, it's addressed, uh, I think, in Part 5, when we're talking Highway 43 South that uh, the, the MR corridors in proximity to Hughes Lake and other wetlands shall be a minimum of 30 meters in width. Um, are we taking extra MR to make that, or is that already available, or are we going to expand upon that, uh, that buffer between the lake and uh, the industrial zoning? Mm. Mr. McCray. Uh, thank you, Mayor Given, uh, through the Chair, Councillor Thies Thiessen. Um, th we spent a lot of time in this plan figuring out what the actual setbacks should be from Hughes Lake. Um, for the longest time, uh, there have been concerns about habitat encroachment and how to deal, you know, how to deal with the coexistence between wild, uh, the habitat and future development. And up until a couple of years ago, there was about a 500 meter setback from the lake. Um, and that's part, in part reason why the highway is located where it is basically splitting the difference evenly between Hermit Lake and Hughes Lake. In our uh, conversations with fish and wildlife, um, I probably back in about March, uh, we were asking some of these questions and they said that the, the habitat, the, the populations have bounced back and there is less concern about having larger setbacks. The key isn't the size of setback, the key is the quality of the setback and how that, uh, it, it, how the shoreline protection is, is addressed. And so we've got roughly a, a 30 meter setback of a combination of ER and MR. We also have stormwater management uh, facilities to contribute to the buffer. So all in all, there's approximately about a 50 meter setback. We also know, based on I I the engagement with fish and wildlife, that the net there is one nesting pair on Hughes Lake, and they nest on the south shore. And so what we have made sure is that all of the trail network around the lake is confined to the north and west sides of the lake, so there is no pedestrian connectivity in proximity to nesting sites, and there's no park space, publicly accessible park space, in proximity to that more sensitive habitat area. Because uh, the worst, last thing you want is dogs and so on getting into those areas because that's been one of the issues around, for example, Crystal Lake. Um, so at the end of the day, what we came up with is a strategy that does the, our best based on the information we have to protect the habitat and still allow not have overly restrictive limitations on development. We haven't sterilized a ton of land uh, because the necessity isn't there. Okay, thank you very much. I actually appreciate that because a couple of years back when we were discussing riparian setbacks, that's roughly about what we were talking about, and I don't think we landed on it, but it sounds like we're landing on it here, so that's great. I guess my other question is you almost sagged into it, but on the south shore, there's currently housing or, or like residential developments in and around there, and I know there's a, there's a plan to phase out residential eventually, maybe, if they don't want to conform to all the industrial development around them. Um, but in regards to that portion of the lake, it said that no, there's no room for the setback. Um, but what happens when those residents, if they do, um, they sell off their portion of land and then we rezone it? Does the plan address that and the protection around the south shore of the lake, especially in that nesting area? Because the last thing I'd hate to, like to see is a, a factory going up, like right up against the shore there. But through the mayor. Uh, the only opportunity that we'd have to take the setback is if there was a subdivision of those lots. If the lots remained in their shape, the environmental reserve around the lake has already been taken while the land was in the county for the area adjacent to the lake in those three lots. If some consolidation of lots were to happen and a subdivision application were to be presented to the city, there would be an opportunity to look at it then. However, the ER has been taken. How, how far back is the ER uh, between the house's lot line and the shoreline? It's hard to know specifically at this point because the you can't really see in this plan the, the lake edge. The picture shows it much deeper than it is there, but if you're out there, you'll notice that the lake is it was receded far back from that point. So there would have to be an environmental study done to figure out exactly where the shoreline would be to see what that distance would be. But the ER taken 
It looks to be about six meters. I don't know exactly. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mary Gavin. Um, I, I'm very impressed with this plan. I, I, I think it's been well thought out and I appreciate the amount of um, public consultation that took place. Um, there's nothing in any of our documentation that talks about the outcomes of the public document or sorry, the public uh, consultation. I can surmise by the amount of green space and the trailways and so on that uh, uh, residential issues have been addressed. But I'd be interested to know in in the reactions uh, from those residential uh, folks who uh, are going to be seeing commercial and industrial grow up all around them. Um, are they satisfied? Are there any outstanding concerns? Um, some information about that would be useful to me. Mr. McCray. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, Councillor Blackburn. And this, this may be a tag team answer. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> the, uh, when we started out this project uh, just over a year ago, uh, when, we were, when we were talking to the residents, that was a significant issue of the current acreage owners out there. Uh, what's happening around us. Mind you, keep in mind, uh, they had just approximately two years prior been through an annexation exercise. So the city was very upfront in its annexation negotiations about its, what its long-term plans were for this area. So, so they, they were aware that, you know, they may have industrial commercial development on their doorsteps at some point in the future. What we tried to ensure through this process was that they had some say in terms of what it looked like, what the buffers might be like around them, and also that um, although there may be some quality of life issues kind of in a transitional form, uh, from a real estate perspective, this is a good move for them because it may not be in the long-term residential sites that these continue to be as, but their, their potential for redevelopment for industrial purposes actually increases their market value. So there were a number of, of those kinds of, uh, of conversations that took place over the course of the plan, um, not just up front, but also when we were dealing with the alternative concepts and trying to find a, a middle ground in terms of a preferred concept. And then uh, when we again did the final stage of engagement uh, in September, um, and the fact that the crowds at these sessions, as the plan came through, the crowds were smaller and smaller, gave us a sense that we were on the right track and that the concerns were being satisfied. I might also uh, point out that throughout the process, outside of these uh, engagement, these formal engagement opportunities, the city also met one-on-one -on -one numerous times with individual owners to talk through specific concerns, and I think that went a long way. And I, I want to, uh, uh, I want to just express as as the as the consultant on this project the extremely good job that administration did in stick handling some of these issues with individual owners. Um, they got down into the weeds on a couple of these issues and were able to assist greatly in resolving them. So, uh, so a, uh, although I don't want them to get too puffed up. I just wanted, to, for the record, to indicate uh, my thanks to uh, Dan, Allison, and the other city staff for for uh, their assistance in this. It was a true team effort in that regard. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Thank you, Mayor Given. I've got questions on two topics. One is, I'm just wondering if there was any regard given to the so this uh, might be tangentially related to this, but the high visibility overlay corridor, has there been any talk about, is there a need to extend that along Highway 43 into this area? Are the current design standards hitting what we need with that? Can you tell me a bit about that? Uh, through the mayor, the um, at this stage, we haven't identified the high visibility corridor. My expectation is, is through the individual outline plans and then finally the land use bylaw, that's where we would actually implement the high visibility corridor and high visibility corridor uh, regulations. Uh, certainly, you know, the Highway 43X may be a good one. Uh, my expectation is, is that people on Highway 43X might be seeing the backs of a lot of industrial buildings. Um, some of the collector roads, which like, for example, Range Road 70, uh, which is a uh, kind of a county collector arterial, arterial road now, will become a city or arterial over time. That would obviously be a high visibility corridor. 
and uh, and then the connection of Range Road 70 to 132nd Avenue is very likely to going to be. So when we are doing more detailed planning at the outline plan stage and then implementing those plans through the land use bylaw, that is when we will be, uh, I guess, putting more more foresight into exactly where these high visibility corridors should be. Great, thank you. And then the other topic I wanted to ask about is this park just to the east of Hughes Lake. Is there, what's the intention of that? Is there a timeline on when we're hoping to get that going? Is the intention just when that land starts getting looked at, getting sold, we'd look at picking it up or do we want to be more aggressive with that? What's What are some of the thoughts behind that? Uh, th through the chair, uh, Councillor Bressy, we recognize that uh, like there's been an ongoing conversation. It just seems like every time we have a hearing on an outline plan or an area structure plan, there's a, and it's an industrial context. It's a question of what to do with open space. And um, because there is such a large area here without a residential component, so there's, not a, there's no demand for school sites and neighborhood parks and that kind of thing. But there are huge opportunities for recreational facilities that aren't dependent on a residential location. You know, you could have a, you know, a, the county sports sportsplex is a perfect example of that, where you've got a large uh, recreational facility in an industrial area. So what we felt was there's an opportunity for a regional park space in this area, whatever it looks like. We've given some ideas, but that would have to be drilled down a bit more. Uh, but we also felt, A, there's an opportunity for that kind of facility out in this area somewhere. We also have a, a park space shown just in air, the airport west area, uh, just straight west of the airport. Could be a similar kind of context there. Um, but also, uh, we, we believed because of the proximity to the airport, there's height limitations there, there's noise limitations and so on. If you look in Cal, if you fly into Calgary, you'll see there's a lot of recreation and open space within the flight pass at the Calgary airport. That same kind of idea could be here. So it was really an area where it's difficult to build, but it could be perfect for some other form of open space, playing fields, whatever. So it's flexible at this point, but we just felt it was important to at least identify the possibility. What, and whether that pans out in the future remains to be seen, but we felt it was important to at least show the opportunity. Great, thank you, and thank you for your work on this. I'm excited to see us being proactive with some of our new lands, and I'm looking forward to seeing some future ASPs before us. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. Councillor Pilat. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, I, I, I also like the plan. I mean, trying to manage 3,000 acres of land and getting all those people on, I believe you said the word stick handling a couple times in there, and that's it would be a lot of work to get that many people organized in, in such a big plan with that kind of a road network. Um, about 1,500 acres, it looks like it's going to be industrial one form or another. I guess my question is, what's our current industrial base in the city limits of Grand Prairie now? And I guess my reason I'm asking that is that as much as I like this industrial, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if we're maybe getting a little bit industrial excited in, in, with some of our ASPs that we have coming up. Um, so I'm just trying to clarify kind of how much acres of land we currently have in industrial. I don't expect a quick answer, but if, if the administration could back on that. Ms. Ms. Downing. I don't have the exact figure of the industrial, but it is available in our annexation application because it was compiled as part of that application. So we do have, as part of our growth study and two subsequent growth studies that were done as part of the annexation, the existing industrial in the city as well as the demand for industrial. And as the years went on and that, that was refined and uh, there was two more documents done, so I can follow up and find all those figures for you. As well, Dave mentioned that there was an industrial strategy as part of the RFP for this process that identified how much industrial and commercial land would be needed looking back at, at some of those figures for this plan. So the acreages that went for industrial and commercial were based on a background report that was done for this project. Okay. Um, to the mayor, I just would like to add uh, one of the things that council should obviously be uh, look, thinking about when uh, looking at this plan is we are not necessarily expecting the industrial in this area to be the same as the current industrial in the city. Uh, a lot of what we're looking at or expecting is that uh, our future industrial out in this area is going to be more like what's in the county, much larger lots, much bigger setbacks uh, than, you know, than, than what currently exists in, say, the Richmond Industrial Park. So when you have much bigger lots, uh, bigger setbacks, obviously the, the land demand or the, our, our requirement for land is obviously greater. Thank you. 
Um, just on the trying to decide how much you know long-term growth we needed for industrial, it, it would be great, I think, for this council to see that with just potentially the, the you know the northeast area structure plan, the, the Bear Lake one, um, and I, I guess it would be nice to know if we had an inventory on what the county has as well. I just my, my gut feeling is we've got probably 70 years worth of land here, and we've and we've got probably another. 1,500 to 2,000 acres that we're planning in other areas that we just might be overstepping on, on industrial. I know there's an appetite for it and it's important. I just want to make sure we're not overstepping um, and maybe having our neighbours in the county think the same thing with a lot of the planning they're doing. Um, but I, I am a fan of the plan. I think it's a, it's a great plan. My only other question on it was, um, was there any consideration of anywhere in there making an area work for a state lots or was it or was it just tough to make that work or no appetite from the, from the, the people in the area? Um, to the mayor, the... Um the land use, um, the land uses basically that that this plan envisions commercial or commercial and industrial, are the land uses that are prescribed in the intermunicipal development plan. So when the city and the county jointly adopted the IDP, we jointly agreed that this area would was going to be exclusively commercial industrial and and would have no residential, and therefore the plan is intended to reflect that. And uh, as uh, somebody mentioned earlier, the Municipal Government Act actually requires that our that this area structure plan be consistent with the IDP and the MDP. So we didn't look for any residential opportunities because that would have been inconsistent with the IDP agreement that we have with the county. Thank you. Okay. I, have a, I have a few more, but I'll maybe hold off and see if there's anybody else. Let's see, uh, Councilor, Thies, Councilor Thiesen, you're next up in my queue here, but Councilor Minhas hasn't been in, so maybe I'll just uh, skip over you and we'll go to Councilor Minhas. Councilor Minhas. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mayor Wellgiven. Um, I really impressed the work you guys done, the tag team, very hard. And it's proactive and you guys convince the people living in there and hopefully they're satisfied with all the effort put being a proactive. Uh, you guys done a lot of answers. My question is for the airport, because it's south side airport can't grow north side, uh, sorry, east side can't, north and west. Did you guys consider if ever we get need to air, airport to in, expand it, do airport have enough land, or do you guys consider some land around that area? Uh, yes, okay. uh, through the mayor, Councillor Minhas, uh, we did have conversations with the airport authority on this. We've also been talking with them over time with other development activity that's been going around. The uh, the airport's operations are not contingent on future expansion of, air, of the current airport lands. They have currently uh, sufficient lands for all of their proposed runway expansions. The only difference would be with the extension of the east-west runway um, towards the west, the only impact would th that would be on this area would be an extension of some of the height restrictions immediately west of the, basically in the runway approach, straight to the west of the runway. Uh, so that's not necessarily a, um, a, a land use concern because you can still, you know, it's just a matter of moderating building height and realigning perhaps future building locations. But uh, the short answer is uh, no, there are no future uh, plans for the airport expansion that would impact this plan. Okay, thanks, Councilman Haas. Um, and before I go to the others, uh, I just had a couple of questions myself. I just, can you uh, um, restate for me, because he did once, um, which intersections are the ones that um, Alberta Transportation is supporting or will be in place right off the start? Um, and maybe just starting from the north end, there's this the sort of um, diagonal intersection there. I just want to confirm that that one will continue to be in. Thanks, Ms. Downing. Thank you, Mayor Given. This intersection is supported and being developed by the province, the one on the very north. This is the one that the province hasn't supported. To, to this point? To this point. Okay. Yes. Yep. However, we did discuss with them that, that we would be showing this on the plan and that at a future date that the city would be responsible for it. This is a flyover and it will be built by the province. Okay. And then this is a full interchange that will be built by the province. So this is the only one that the city hopes to build that isn't part of the province's plan. And at what point will that flyover be built? Is the province building that um, as they're building Highway 43X or is that something that will follow after? Um, to the mayor, I believe that that flyover is their phase two construction. So that is not part, what, not part of what they're currently constructing. 
Okay. And then last, um, the two air, the two connections that are shown going into the airport lands um, to the um, to the east. The airport at one point did have a development plan that showed potential lotting uh, on that west side of the airport lands. Do those roads align with the concepts that were shown back in that plan, or is that plan still relevant? Or um, did administration examine the airport's long-term development plans um, for those areas? Uh, Your Worship, the um, the airport does have a development plan for that area that they are currently reviewing, so that's subject to change. These lo access locations were actually originally shown in the Northwest Area Structure Plan that was prepared in 2000, 2001. So we were just basically continuing what was already a, in a plan of record. So we were considering. One thing you have to be aware of when you're doing these plans is connectivity with existing plans on abutting lands. And so this. Uh, plan was designed so it integrated with that existing plan that was in place. Thank you. Uh, I see Councillor Platt's in the queue and then Councillor Thiessen, if you did have some that weren't, an weren't answered, you'd get a chance here. Councillor Platt. Thanks, Mayor Gibbett. Uh, I just want to clarify that we're also, I guess, with approving this, we're also approving Appendix X, the design centers. Is that the intent with approving this tonight or is that a separate? Well, uh, just to clarify, so the recommendation tonight is to do the first and second readings only, and uh, the third reading would come after some consultation with the County of Grand Prairie. So we wouldn't technically be approving anything tonight, uh, but in terms of the, 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 the way the document's set up, when we move to third reading, uh, then was the intention that uh, that would form part of the, the, um, the bylaw, Mr. Walton. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, the design guidelines would form part of the area structure plan itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. I guess, I guess so on that note, maybe it looks like we have some time. I'm just wondering if we've put some thought into making sure our design, I know uh, it's a competitive environment, but I just want to make sure we've put some thought into how apples to apples are we with the, the neighbours around us that are doing uh, this type of development, um, just to ensure that we're maybe not, uh, you know, proper cross-sections, proper landscape requirements, proper setbacks, or if we're overstating and then we're going to potentially not be at a, at a good market advantage. With this, I just want to know how we stack up. Uh, administration may have additional thoughts on the matter, Councillor Pilot. Um, our feeling was yes, there is the issue of the competition and the level playing field, if you will. At the same time, however, there's also a need to be strategic in terms of things, call it curb appeal, uh, and because we're dealing with some high visibility areas here. So the intent was, for example, with the design guidelines, they are purely a guideline, they are not going to be, they are not standards. It's basically guidance for uh, for potential future implementation or guidance to developers and builders. Um, the We also have in those design guidelines uh, and in the plan itself, we talk about things like rural cross sections for roadways. So there are opportunities where there wouldn't be curb and gutter, it would be you know, rural cross section like you see in the county and so on. So there is a conscious effort to be competitive in some of those elements where it makes sense and in other areas where you know it is more appropriate to ramp up the standards a bit based on location so um, it, it, trying to get the best of both okay. into this and through the mayor it's also uh, our expectation that as we go forward the uh, our it's our intention to um, write and have adopted new land use bylaw districts for this area that are more similar to some of the county's current land use districts. So uh, as, as uh, the alderman indicated about comparing apples to apples, uh, what we are proposing or will be proposing to do would be to adopt new districts that are, are, are very or much more similar to uh, county land use districts with, this, with respect to lot size, setbacks, landscaping standards, park, parking standards, those sorts of things. So uh, the district standards would be more of an apples to apples comparison than what we have right now. Thank you, Mr. Well, I appreciate that. I know it's, it's always fun to be competitive, but also maybe try to do the right thing sometimes too. So I can appreciate it's a, it's hard to put in the right standard sometimes. Um, my only other, my, only, my last question, I guess on this is, you know, right now it's, you guys have kind of give options of what we could look at for servicing for sanitary and, and potentially water out in this area. Has there been any preliminary numbers around on what the city might have to look at investing if we want to really spur this development on? Um, because at this point, it's 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 going to be a fairly large upfront cost for a developer to take on a quarter out by the Highway 43X, and I'm just wondering if we've had some preliminary numbers on what that might look like. 
Uh, uh, through through the chair, uh, the short answer is no. Um, that those are conversations that would have to occur when there is development proposals on the table. If when people start coming through the door, um, that's why we focus so much on interim servicing or on-site servicing, private servicing, like you would see in any other rural area, because. Once the highway is in, um, there may be pressure for individual businesses to go out further out, you know, to take advantage of that, and recognizing that that's not going to happen easily if if there's a high demand for for a power, like you're not going to see a car wash or you know like a truck stop or something that has a high water demand without that permanent connection. So, at the end of the day, there that would have to be a conversation that uh, is had uh, at a future time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Plot. Councillor Thiessen, did you have any other questions? Yeah, actually, I have a couple still. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so I, my, my first question is about good neighbours. Uh, and there was something in the plan that actually caught my eye, and I was wondering if that was making us good neighbours or not. And it's under Section 6 under Highway 43 South, and it says, uh oh it's uh, in areas where industrial or commercial uses are proposed adjacent to existing country residential development, a maximum maximum 20 meter wide buffer shall be provided to allow for a transition in land use now uh, to some people 20 meters is generous to other people like myself I'm like well that's 10 of me and as overwhelming as that may be for council to have 10 of me in a room you lay me out lengthwise 10 10 across and that may be underwhelming to the residential landowners um, the, the word that actually bothered me was maximum because that also implies then it, there could be minimums that we aren't meeting as far as having this buffer between a residential develop our residential lot that doesn't maybe want to move despite the commercial industrial development around it and what might be encroaching on it so do we have minimums or is that a guaranteed maximum it doesn't get bigger than this and uh, does it get smaller than that thank you through the mayor one of the things we looked at when we were establishing these buffers is where the residences were on these lots. So on the existing lot, there is quite a large buffer on the property itself from the adjacent land use. So this is an additional to that. However, these buffers will be refined at the outline plan stage and the landowners specifically impacted will be involved. It will be their land that is being developed. Uh, and they will be part of, of that process to establish what the buffers would be. A 20 meter buffer from these large country residential lots is is reasonable and you know lar larger than we're doing for environmental setbacks, I would say. So I think that uh, it's a sufficient setback. And one of the things that's written into the plan is that those buffers will be established as municipal reserve. So there is an avenue to to get rid of the municipal reserve at some point when the lots possibly change to industrial. And we have heard from a number of these country residential landowners that they see the opportunities for their land becoming industrial uses. So I think that there are a number of them that, that w would like to fit in with the fabric and won't be seeing some buffering. However, there are others that will, will want to see that buffer. Thank you very much. Your response actually gives me great confidence, and uh, I appreciate that. Um, the last question that I had is uh, around transit. Now, I scoured the entire ASP, and we have about a page and a half dedicated to pedestrian and cycling traffic, um, and we have one word dedicated to transit, which is transit, um, but it doesn't outline where potential future stops are or what our plan is to get transit out there. Currently, right now, the county's been asking us for transit services out to Claremont so that they can service their workforce. How are we going to service our workforce as this develops? Uh, through the chair, Councillor uh, Thiessen, the um, individual or specific transit alignments are addressed through outline plan at a more detailed stage. Generally speaking, um, Transit routes follow collector roadways and major collector roadways, and those most of those roadways are outlined or shown in this area structure plan at this kind of 50,000 foot level. Uh, that the detail about um, location of transit stops and and route routing and so on and so forth is more of a 10,000 foot uh, consideration. So at this at this stage, we can't get too prescriptive about transit, other than to recognize the fact that transit will you know it's a city policy to serve new areas as as demand warrants and so it's our assumption that as development proceeds in this area as in other all of the other annexed areas as they developed 
where transit is warranted or needed, that it would be that it would be added to the network. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see anybody else in the queue with any other questions for the team. Uh, so I'll ask if there's anyone here, I'll open the presentation submission portion of the public hearing, ask if, if there's anyone in attendance that wish to speak to the Huge Lake Area Structure Plan. Is there anyone here that wish to speak to the uh, Huge Lake Area Structure Plan? Oh, excuse me, uh, I don't think we did, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. That was a really long presentation. I kind of forgot where we were. Um, so I'll continue to ask if there's anybody who wishes to speak to the um, Huge Lake Area Structure Plan. I don't see anybody uh, coming to make any presentations. Uh, one last opportunity for council if there are any questions for administration. Did we, we worked that out of our system. We got them all out. Okay. Uh, then I will close the public hearing. We'll move on to business arising. Thank you. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. I move that Council give first reading to bylaw C-1367, being a bylaw to adopt the Hughes Lake Area Structure Plan. Okay, thanks very much, Council Clayton. So I will uh, call for the vote on first reading. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Clayton. I'd move that Council give second reading to bylaw C-1367. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Clayton. So this motion is open for discussion and debate as noted by administration. Uh, there is a uh, process under the Intermunicipal Development Plan and so the intention here tonight is to uh, only proceed to second reading. We wouldn't follow up with uh, third reading uh, and uh, that will give the uh, dispute resolution process under the IDP an opportunity to work its way through uh, where we can discuss this with the County Grand Prairie. So is there any discussion or debate with respect to second reading? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, I believe that handles all of our business here. Uh, so just to look uh, to management, to administration, uh, in terms of that process with the County of Grand Prairie, so is there a mechanism for formalizing this or an expectation of when this would come back to council or is that a to-be-determined uh, look to the manager of planning and development, Mr. Johnson. At this point, I would say that it's to be determined. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Council. And again, to the project team uh, for um, the exceptional amount of work that went into the Hughes Lake plan. Uh, great to see the city of Grand Prairie getting some progress on our uh, the lands that we uh, proceeded with through annexation. Um, so we'll move on into unfinished business, uh, starting with item 7.1. Uh, boring bylaw C-1362. Can I have a motion uh, to give a second reading to that bylaw? Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I would move that Council give second reading to bylaw C-1362 being the boring bylaw for the Bear Creek Outdoor Pool. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, that motion is for second reading, so we can absolutely have discussion and debate. Any discussion and debate on that motion? Um, I guess just one question. Are we at a point where the uh, project has proceeded where we will eventually need, uh, are we at the point where we're going to have to start to remit the funds, I guess, to the uh, construction? Is that why we're getting to the point where we're actually going to close off this bylaw? So, I don't know, don't know if that's Mr. Miyagi or uh, uh, for Ms. Walker. Ms. Walker? Uh, thank you, Mayor Given. Um, we are uh, anticipating requiring the funds in March, and so... Um, that's when it's scheduled for. If the funds aren't required at that time, of course, we won't take it until June. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I don't see any other discussion or debate on second reading. I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, is that Councillor Thiessen? Yep, I can do it again if you like. Please. I would move that Council give third reading to bylaw C-1362. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries, and that'll take us to 7.2, bylaw C-1363. Councillor O'Toole. I move the Council give second reading to bylaw C-1363, being the borrowing bylaw for the construction of the grandstands at the K or CKC West Field. Thanks very much, Councillor Tool. So that's a motion for second reading, so we can have discussion and debate. Is there any discussion and debate with respect to this borrowing bylaw? Seeing none, everybody must be fairly well aware of the project. Uh, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. 
Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor O'Toole. And I move that we give third reading to bylaw C-1363 tonight. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on third and final reading? Again, seeing nobody ringing in, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. And finally, we'll move to item 7.3, uh, council member appointments. Uh, we have a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, these are uh, coming as recommendations from the mayor, so I suppose I can speak to them. Uh, there were a couple of uh, points where we, uh, administration, identified that uh, we required actually to appoint alternate council members. It's not typically our practice to appoint alternates uh, for external agencies, boards, and commissions, but there were a couple uh, that, that was required for, the Grand Spirit Foundation and the Regional Emergency Management Committee, and then uh, uh, it was identified um, that the city's uh, subdivision development appeal board bylaw actually requires us to appoint three, although that hasn't been our practice uh, for many, many years, uh, for at least four years, uh, and so uh, so there is an additional name there, so uh, council could see the names listed in the package, and I look for someone to uh, formalize that with a motion to, to um, approve those recommendations. Councillor Minhas. Thank you, Mayor. Well given. I'll move the motion uh, to give, not the second reading, give a council to <laughs> appoint the councillor plot as the alternate councillor member represent in to the Grant Spirit Foundation Board. Yeah, and I think I think we do. You could even just say, actually, to save you, uh, I think you could even just say uh, as recommended. Yeah, I'll move as recommended. Rest of. I know when we do the big full list, that's usually what the motion is that move the mayor's recommendation for appointments to boards and committees as recommended. So that probably works here. Um, is there any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. That motion carries. Um, that handles all of our unfinished business. I don't believe we have any reports this evening, and so we can move straight into committee business, uh, starting with item 9.1, Community Living Committee from December 19th, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I would move that Council receive the minutes of the Community Living Committee held Tuesday, December 19th, 2017. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Any errors or omissions that we need to correct? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. <clears throat> Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Thiessen. All right. I guess my question to council is, do you want to hear me talk a lot or just to move uh, the recommendation as it is typed out? I can, Or we can do them individually one at a time. I have no problem with any suggestion. But uh, Councillor Thiessen, they're, they're individual RFPs. I think we sh I would think that we should have uh, individual votes for each of the RFPs. Yeah, that sounds fair. All right. Um, so in saying that, uh, I would move uh, the council award the following for a four-year contract term from April 1st, 2018 to March 31st, 2022. That being uh, the RFP 51-431-17 centralized assessment and that is awarded to the Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA, in the amount of $1,552,680 exclusive of GST as the highest rank proponent meeting city specifications. Uh, just to speak to this, um, actually, I'm going to speak to all of them. Uh, this is uh, provincial and federal grant money that's handed down actually through the province and to the city of Grand Prairie for us to hand out to different service organizations to help give people supports or assess people as to what their, their uh, mental health needs are and their housing needs might be, as well as to um, ensure that they can maintain housing. So we've identified four different areas as, as laid out uh, through our province's homelessness strategy and our Housing First strategy as to what the best way to do that is. And so these are the four parts of that. Uh, and this is the first one with centralized assessment. Okay, thanks very much, Council Thiessen. Uh, thanks for that clarification about exactly where the dollars are coming from. And I would just pass on to Council. Um, the uh, RFPs for each of these services was developed by the Community Advisory Board, uh, subcommittee of the Community Advisory Board on Housing and Homelessness. Uh, the CAB Board RFP Committee, I believe, also worked with City Administration to review the RFPs and, and evaluate the submissions, uh, and then the recommendations came here. And so they don't, uh, uh, it's a bit of a different process. Um, uh, in other areas where we have city dollars and it's uh, more directly city staff, but city staff and the Community Advisory Board on homeless, Housing and Homelessness and members were involved in the evaluation of these RFPs. Is there any other discussion or debate on the first of the four? 
Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Thiessen. And thank you very much, Mayor Given. I would uh, move that Council award uh, RFP 52-431-17 uh, for a four-year contract term from April 1st, 2018 to March 31st, 2022 to the case management team may award it to Canadian Mental Health Association in the amount of 2240000 exclusive GST as the highest ranked proponent meeting city specifications. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. I would move that uh, Council award RFP 52-431-17 uh, for a four-year contract term from April 1st, 2018 to March 31st, 2022 for case management team B to HIV North Society in the amount of $2,238,224 exclusive GST as the highest ranked proponent meeting city specifications. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate? Again, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. Motion carries. Councillor Thiessen. And for the final RFP award, I would move that uh, Council award RFP 53-431-17 for a four-year contract term from April 1st, 2018 to March 31st, 2022 in rapid rehousing to Center Point Facilitation Incorporated in the amount of $1,583,348 Exclusive GST is the highest ranked proponent, meeting city specifications. Okay, okay. thanks, Council Thiessen. Once again, any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, next recommendation is to our supply of graders and multi year purchase. Uh, so I'd move that Council Award Tender T-08-547-17 to Brandt Tractor Limited in the amount of $1,354,000.00, exclusive GST as the lowest qualified bidder, meeting city specifications. Uh, just speaking to this, this is uh, fully allocated within our budget and uh, doesn't constrain our budget at all. Uh, I do believe, uh, it's, I'm trying to refresh my memory, it's been a while, but one or the other is, there's a portion that's coming from Fleet Reserve, but that was also accounted for in our budget as well. Uh, and I have it from a very excellent source that these are incredible deals that we are getting in this RFP tender. So, Okay, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. I should have got out before uh, Councillor Thiessen's nice speech, but I would like to be clear on, th on this uh, as my husband works for this company. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Clayton. So Councillor Clayton declares a conflict of interest and we'll leave the Council Chambers. Uh, is there any other discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. We can invite Councillor Clayton back in. Oh, oh sorry. We also have the, uh, sorry. Uh, and so Councillor Clayton's intention was uh, that both of these uh, she was declaring conflict of interest for, item 9.1.2 and item 9.1.3. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Yes, and this is uh, item 9.1.3 is for a supply of backhoes. Uh, and I would move that Council award tender T-06-547-17 to Brandt Tractor Limited in the amount of $363,000 and no cents, exclusive GST as the lowest qualified bidder meeting city specifications. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Again, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. We can invite Councillor Clayton back in. Um, Councillor Thiessen, is there anything else that you want to highlight from that set of minutes? Yeah, there was there was uh, one one thing that I would like to highlight from from that set of minutes. Uh, I was involved in our uh, discussion around uh, all of these tenders and uh, our homelessness initiatives. Um, that uh, a, a motion came out, uh, which was also identified in the report as the potential for the city to create an arm's length housing development corporation, uh, and uh, to work with that within a timeline that isn't rushed, but. Uh, one that would, uh, I guess, achieve our aims if we we're going to create such a thing. The motion was made by, by your worship, uh, and I think it's an excellent step in the right direction. Uh, being involved with housing corporations in Edmonton and Calgary, uh, these things really do work. 
was really happy to see the report come through council. I'm happy to see the report made by yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Um, we'll move on um, to, I think we have um, Corporate Services Committee, Councillor O'Toole. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I move the council receive the minutes of the Corporate Services Committee meeting held uh, Tuesday, December 12th, 2017, as presented. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor O'Toole. And out of that meeting, I have a couple of... Uh, motions to make and we'll start off with 9.2.1 uh, 2018 business revitalization zone uh, budget and i move the council review and adopt the 2018 business revitalization zone budget in council chambers on monday march 12 2018 at 6 30 p.m as presented and further direct administration to notify the businesses within the business revitalization zone of the above date by letter accompanied by a copy of the proposed 28 business revitalization zone budget okay. thanks very much councillor tool councillor Bressy. thank you mayor given i just had a question for administration about this that letter who does it go to does it go to the building owners or to the business owners that might be leasing space miss walker It goes to the business owner. Awesome, thank you. Okay, thanks, Councilor Bressy. Um, just, uh, um, Councilor Tool, I know uh, how it was worded in our package. It says that Council review and adopt the 2018 budget. I'm not sure if we can vote to adopt the budget today without reviewing it. I think what the intention here is that we're setting the date that we will review the budget, and we'll choose then whether or not we're going to adopt it. I don't think we're going to vote that we're going to review it and adopt it then. So I, I just it may be semantics, but it just in terms of the wording of the of the resolution here, I think it should just be that we review the 2018 uh, budget, and at that time we'll choose if we adopt it. So how would I remove the word adopt and uh, then we'll I, be all good? Yeah, I think just uh, council review the 2018 business revitalization zone and then continue on from there. I think the I can't think we I don't think we can say that we're adopting it yet. Any other uh, discussion or debate? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor O'Toole. Uh, 9.2.2 bylaw C 1368 well dwelling equipment tax bylaw. This was a bylaw that was placed by the Alberta government back in 1948 and due to the annexation of the lands a couple of years ago uh, we have to incorporate that as the, we do have drilling taking place in the municipality of Grand Prairie. So with that I have uh, moved that council give first reading to bylaw C-1368 being the well equipment tax bylaw. Okay, thanks very much, Council Tool. There's no discussion or debate on first reading, so I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries, Councillor Tool. I also move that uh, we give second reading to bylaw C-1368. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Tool. Any discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, I'll just say that this is a uh, very common place in rural municipalities. Uh, I think we would be in a very similar sort of um, framework uh, as the County of Grand Prairie in this. Um, and there is a relatively small amount of revenue that uh, will be able to be captured um, and, and that was missed uh, because this wasn't in place last year, somewhere in an order of magnitude of under $10,000, I believe, from the report. Yeah, you correct. Uh, a lot of MDs and counties within the province uh, Establish the bylaws we are doing today. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Tool. Any discussion or debate further? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor O'Toole. I move that we have third reading of bylaw C 1368 at this meeting 
Okay, thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. So this is a motion to have third and final reading at this meeting in order to have all three readings of a bylaw at the same meeting. Council needs to be intentional and have a motion to approve having third reading. Uh, for this motion to pass, it must pass unanimously. If it does not, then third and final reading would come back at a subsequent council meeting. Uh, is there any discussion and debate as to the merits of having third and final reading here tonight? Seeing nobody ringing in, then I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously, so we can have third and final reading, Councillor O'Toole. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay, I move that uh, we give third reading to uh, bylaw C-1368, being the well equipment tax bylaw. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor O'Toole. Any discussion or debate on third and final reading? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor O'Toole, was there anything else you want to highlight from that set of minutes? Yes, uh, there was a couple other bite items in the other business portion of the meeting, and uh, the uh, we come up with a possibility of reviewing uh, the standing committee of council, and uh, we were looking at cost. Uh, developing a strategic issues committee of the whole and uh, that new committee would provide council a, a formal venue to discuss items of strategic nature on a regular basis. Uh, we also talked about and had a good discussion on the approach to our advisory boards and committees and uh, administration is going to take some of that suggestions back, review it and uh, we'll come up with some, uh, some scenarios in the future. Thanks very much, Councillor Tool. I think that takes us on to uh, infrastructure and protective services. Councillor Clayton. Oh, sorry, Councillor Clayton. Um, uh, Councillor. Oh, Councillor Blackburn stepped Blackburn. in as chair. Thank, Thank you very great. much. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, he did such a great job, too. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, thank you, Mary Given. Um, I would move that Council receive the minutes of the Infrastructure and Protective Services Committee meeting held Jan January 9th, 2018, as presented. Thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn. My apologies for forgetting that you stepped in and uh, did such an able job at, a, at an interesting and exciting meeting. Uh, any discussion or debate on the minutes? Seeing nobody ringing in, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. I think I'm... Um, thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you. There is um, one item coming out of the meeting that requires a vote tonight. Um, so I move that Council approve the following resolution. That City Council support the joint application by the City of Grand Prairie, the Town of Sexsmith, the Town of Wembley, and the Horse Lake First Nation to the Alberta Community Partnership Grant Program to seek funding for consultation assistance towards the development of a potential regional intermunicipal, dis sorry, intermunicipal development plan and intermunicipal collaboration framework. And speaking to this motion, um, the uh, Alberta Community Partnership did provide funding for the pre-work that was done um, amongst this group um, in 2017 and it was the recommendation of the group that we apply for another grant so that there would be uh, consultation services regarding the review and the um, um, ongoing work to, to be done by the community, uh, sorry, by the committee. Um, the application deadline was the 2nd of January and so the application was sent in and there is a deadline of February 2nd for the participating municipalities to um, um, make a motion on um, supporting the application. So that's why it's brought forward today. Thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn. Any other questions or discussion? Uh, I guess a question for uh, administration. Um, have the other partner municipalities uh, provided any uh, indication is there have they provided any resolutions of support at this time? Uh, and is there an opportunity for other municipalities to join in the process later on, should they choose? Mr. Olinger? Yeah, 
Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. To um, answer that question, the uh, town of uh, Wembley has approved that uh, same resolution. The town of Sexsmith was expecting to um, approve the resolution. We've asked the uh, Horse Lake First Nation to provide support as well, and we expect that they will. And other municipalities can uh, join as well. We've uh, invited the uh, County of Grand Prairie, the Village of Hythe, and the Town of Beaver Lodge to join our group as well. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Olinger. Uh, any other discussion or debate? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Thank you. That motion carries. Councillor Blackburn, was there anything else interesting that happened at that meeting? Thank you, Mayor Given. Yes, there certainly was. <laughs> um, two items that uh, I'm sure that everybody has already heard about. One was the decision on the disposition of the fire hall. And um, after a great deal of consideration, um, the, the uh, committee recommended that administration uh, do some further research and investigation into um, the RFPs that were reviewed um, with the intent of coming back in a month's time to give us more information before a final decision is made. Uh, the other one that was interesting was the application for land use bylaw regarding the petroleum facility. And um, we ended up giving conditional land use bylaw approval with the conditions being that um, um, the, the province successfully deals with the uh, interventions that have come forward from some of the landowners. I think it was very important for us to express our concern to landowners there that, that we understood their concerns but that we don't have the ability to uh, contravene a decision made by the uh, Alberta Energy Regulator when it comes to this type of land use. And so uh, we did the best we could to hear them out and perhaps give them an opportunity to, to uh, uh, rehearse the kinds of things that they'll bring forward to the AER. It was a very interesting meeting and uh, thank you to Councillor Clayton for handing me the the longest standing committee meeting we've had yet this year. <laughs> thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn, and, and thanks for ably stepping in uh, to chair that meeting. Uh, I think that handles all of our committee business. Um, I don't believe we had any items of correspondence for this evening. Uh, and there were no delegations this evening, so there's no delegation business. I don't believe we have any notices of motion. So that takes us to council member reports. Um, I'm going to try, uh, I will make a report on the AUMA this evening, um, but I will do that at the end. It just feels odd for me to call my own number right at the start of the external reports. So we'll start uh, with Councillor Blackburn and uh, the Grand Prairie Library Board. Thank you, Mary Given. Um, the, the Library Board met on the 9th of January. Pardon me while I just grab my notes. Um, Two things of note, uh, the library is going to be investing in a, a software system called Savannah by Orange Boy. And Savannah is a marketing tool that starts by being a data mining tool. Um, there's lots of information that most organizations gather, especially a, a place like a library where they have records about um, people and what it is that they borrow and information about the types of um, services and um, materials that are loaned out. But that information really isn't easily accessed and gathered up to use for, uh, for the purposes of, of an organization. So this piece of software mines that data, puts it together in categories that are um, useful uh, and in this case for marketing strategies so that more people within the community can become aware of the services that the library has to offer. It also provides information and the methods for marketing information about um, the library to our existing members um, in a fashion that would um, ensure that we're sending information to, uh, to those people on things that they are likely to be interested in. 
it's an interesting piece and I'm looking forward to seeing how that will work. Uh, the other thing I will tell you is that um, our uh, executive director, Maureen Curry, did a very informative year in review report for the board. Um, it was a very uh, successful and active year for the library. And I will just highlight one item that uh, turned out to be very interesting and is rather unique in our area. They have a section in the library called Most Wanted. And it's a section of shelving where uh, books that are currently popular are on display. And if you walk into the library hoping to borrow a particular title and you know that you may have to go on a waiting list because everybody wants it, if it happens to be on the most wanted shelf at the time that you walk in, it's yours to borrow for a week uh, without being in the queue. Um, it's turned out to be a very successful idea and uh, we're one of the few province, or sorry, few libraries in the province that offers such a service. So that's just one of the unique things that's been going on in the past year. Great. Thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, do you also want to provide an update on Grand Spirit Foundation? Yes. Uh, thanks, Mary Gavin. Um, Grand Spirit Foundation uh, Management Committee met today and uh, we're dealing with um, a number of issues. Pardon me. Um, to do with the ongoing operation. The, the one thing that's most interesting is that uh, there's been correspondence from the city to the Grand Spirit Foundation regarding some land that's available in uh, Smith subdivision. And uh, uh, it's something that Grand Spirit Foundation is really quite interested in. And the interesting part about it is that um, currently there is a trend towards trying to put um, uh, low income social housing and seniors housing side by side because of the synergies that the residents of both can um, realize from one another. So it's an ongoing interest and uh, we'll be very interested to see how things develop um, as the use of that land is determined. The other thing that I'll mention very briefly is that we're working with the um, Hythe Pioneer Seniors Lodge um, regarding some funding requisition that they may be um, they may be after. Uh, our board is going to meet with their board uh, in the near future and uh, I may be coming back to this council with some information about the challenges that Hythe is facing and the requests that they're making to uh, Grand Spirit. Thanks very much Councillor Blackburn uh, and Councillor Thiessen you had Mighty Peace Watershed. Yes thank you very much Mayor given uh, so you had a lot of Mighty Peace Watershed here the last two weeks. Uh, I'll start with uh, January 4th, uh, where uh, the steering committee for the Integrated Watershed Management Plan sat together in McLennan and we went over the accumulated comments on the Integrated Watershed Management Plan draft. Um, there was lots of good input there. Uh, basically, most people were, were saying that we had it pretty right and most were just like uh, picture and text, uh, I, I guess, changes. Um, <clears throat> So we then uh, dealt with a way, or we, we figured out a way that we we're going to deal with those comments and uh, the choice of the steering committee was to just identify each comment and tell the, the respondent what how we dealt with that and how that's being incorporated in the plan. It did lead to a couple changes, but uh, that went to the board for approval uh, and uh, for the week later. Uh, but uh, all in all, uh, it seems like we're on the right track with uh, developing this plan for now. That should at least take us the next 10 to 20 years over the life cycle of the Peace River. Uh, next, uh, last week, uh, there's two days out in Grimshaw, uh, first being for the groundwater forum uh, in Grimshaw, uh, a day that it was minus 50 outside traveling on the highway. Uh, it was minus 50 in Grimshaw as well as it was in Grand Prairie, so it was mighty cold. But uh, we might have got a person for every minus centigrade we got because there's 52 people in attendance in the little Legion Hall in Grimshaw uh, for the Groundwater Forum, which is great uh, considering uh, we're talking about the hydrogeological history and the cycles of that created the Grimshaw aqu aquifers from the Peace River. And it's kind of an anomaly as according to the Geological Survey of Alberta on how it, how it uh, created itself. Uh, essentially, uh, they, they were telling the fascinating history of 
of the Peace River used to sit 300 meters above where it is now, and then through glacial damming, just sort of came down and eroded away the landscape to where the Peace River is to this day, and thus created several different types of water bodies in the Grimshaw area, one of which being the Grimshaw Gravel Aquifer, uh, which is uh, one of the freshest water sources in all of Alberta, uh, and uh, largely untouched considering the fact that it's surrounded by gravel, a lot of silt and other debris and that could dissolve into it and contaminate the water and make it more salty or saline. Uh, but uh, it was quite interesting to see that. And then the mystery surrounding, I think, uh, Brian Smearden from the Alberta Geological Survey, he was just blown away by the fact that Lake Cardinal sits on top of a gravel bed, but it never drains. And he imagined that it should drain, but he's also thinking the reason why it doesn't, and it just sits there, is there may be some kind of blockade, whether that's old damming or a large boulder or even just a clay lining at the bottom that keep it there. Uh, but uh, they, they said there was a, a fascinating study and one that they're looking to uh, undertake in the next uh, couple of years. And when some of the landowners were talking about the mysterious springs that just appear on their land, uh, they got all excited and started writing down even more stuff. So it was a uh, great uh, dialogue with the residents in and around the area. It's uh, really fascinating to, to de learn uh, new stuff, especially uh, certain terms. Uh, the only one that really stuck out for me was Moreno. Uh, being the ridges that are caused by that glacial damming, but uh, I guess I should have paid more attention in high school. Um, anyways, then we met uh, again on, at our board meeting on January 12th, where the entirety of the board was able to go over the comments that were received from the Integrated Watershed Management Plan draft, uh, and uh, that went through swimmingly. Uh, so the next step then was to start planning our WPAC summit. And uh, I really encourage you all to mark your calendars, June 19th to 22nd in Peace River. Uh, 11 of the WPACs from across the province will be gathering in Peace River. This one being led up by the Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance as it is our year to do it. So I am entitled to be there. And uh, being uh, members yourself, since I sit on the committee, I think you all are welcome. So uh, June 19th, 22nd, everything water, anything you ever want to know about water is going to be happening at the WPAC Summit in June. Um, finally, uh, we also received a couple more presentations, another one from the Alberta Geological Survey at the board meeting, um, and, uh, and uh, we also had a presentation from uh, guest speaker Scott Miller from the AER talking about area-based regulation, which is, I think, a step up uh, in what they had before, which is play-based regulation, which is sort of like tinkering on their Duvernay Montney. Now they've moved to area-based regulation. Uh, and it's a shift in their regulatory approach to focus on the unique area conditions. Now that they have a good understanding of the local conditions, environment issues, and their requirements needed to uh, keep that uh, keep that area as pristine as possible, uh, while also allowing industrial use to develop it. Uh, before I let you go on this one, I know I hear everyone's heads probably yay water. Um, but Peace River, and June 19th, 22nd, uh, the, the topic of the summit is uh, source water to drinking water. So uh, if you wanted to know how we tap into that, it's a variety of different water types across the province, this is, this is it. But, you know, water is life. Just like we need air to breathe, we need water to survive as well. So the more we understand about it, the more we are masters of our own destiny. So thanks for listening all. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, and so I guess this comes back around. So this is... In my entire time at the council table, I haven't, as mayor, provided any updates on external agencies, boards, or commissions, uh, and so this is it feels really odd. Um, but uh, I am representing the city of Grand Prairie at the AU May table. Um, I was there uh, last week for a municipal governance committee meeting, and I thought I'd provide council a bit of an overview and update on what the municipal governance committee uh, is going to be doing over the course of the next year. Um, the committee identified um, what the committee priorities were going to be. Um, these were approved by the board uh, a couple of weeks ago. So the Municipal Governance Committee is going to be looking at the overall implementation of MGA change management. As you all know, the Municipal Government Act was changed. Uh, municipalities and AUMA members across the province need a significant amount of support on, okay, so what do we do now? And they're looking for tools to help some, help the, support them as they come to grips with the uh, new uh, the changes to the MGA. So that, that will all go through Municipal Governance Committee. Uh, the committee will also look at the legislative aspects of cannabis like leg ugh, legalization uh, they will work on a second phase of work related to reforming AUMA's internal resolution process for the uh, convention uh, 
the committee will also undertake analysis and advocacy relating to the Local Authorities Election Act, which hasn't been updated in some time. There's a significant number of changes that, and improvements that could be made to that, and the committee will be undertaking some work to encourage the province to do that. Uh, the committee also has responsibility for um, analyzing ways to support women in municipal government. Uh, this was an area that had a committee of its own previously. Uh, the board chose to uh, assign that body of work to the Municipal Governance Committee. Um, I think the intention there is the, that it shouldn't be lost sight of, um, but that there may not have been the volume of work uh, based on the fact that uh, we're out of the election cycle and more into an operational cycle. Uh, and then finally, the uh, MG committee also has responsibility uh, and will be doing a, a little bit of work on trying to provide some advice for municipalities on best practices on how they might uh, advance uh, relationships with Indigenous communities in their vicinities. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty full plate for the MG committee, uh, really interesting stuff that will be coming in front. Um, and for the second half of the meeting, we... Uh, had a presentation uh, from Stantec, who is actually doing some work uh, on behalf of the AUMA and the AAMDNC, the Rural Municipalities Association. Uh, those two associations together received a grant from the province to develop uh, a, a suite of workbooks that uh, can be used by municipalities to start to develop uh, ICFs. And so uh, we're working on an ICF process flowchart as well as a draft workbook of toolkits that individual municipalities and municipal administrators can use as they start to enter the ICF discussion um, in their regions. One of the uh, significant themes that came up uh, was, um, and, and I was happy to see it included in the process and all the workbook tools, uh, was the opportunity to consider not just the minimum requirements under the, under the Act that you have a uh, ICF with your neighbour that you're directly physically adjacent to, um, but the opportunity to consider multilateral, and that's the terminology that they're using, is multilateral ICF arrangements with more than one party. Uh, that's certainly the direction that we've been going so far with our concept of a regional ICF and the high degree of interconnection we have with other municipalities in our region based on services. Uh, and it's great to see that that's something that uh, the work that AUMA and AAMDNC are doing together. Um, there was a representative from AAMDNC in the room as we had that discussion, and a representative from AUMA will go to their board when their board's discussing it. Um, and it appeared that um, AAMDNC broadly, is supportive of uh, considering the multilateral approach, considering that many of the rural municipalities will have um, many multiple uh, ICFs required in order to meet the intent of the legislation. I think the County of Grand Prairie has something like eight that they would need to, or eight or more that they would be required under the Act to do. And so I think the concept of a multilateral approach with more than two parties being in any one agreement is something that the Rural Municipalities Association is actually quite supportive of. So it was good to see that. And, uh, good to be able to give some input in such an important provincial process. And uh, I will try and provide updates as we go to council and uh, and provide any information that might be useful to administration as, as it comes up. Um, we'll move on to council member. If there, sorry, if there aren't any external other external reports, if we didn't miss any, then we'll move to council member roundtable and we'll start with Councillor Bressy. Thank you, Mayor Given. What I want to talk about today is the Alberta Summer Games. I'm very excited for this event. We're going to be having thousands of kids and their coaches and their referees and their parents and their siblings and their who knows else joining us here in Grand Prairie for some excellent sporting fun. I speak for, from personal experience that if you bring kids to our community, give them a few days of great hospitality, some adults will follow for work and maybe investment and all of that. So I'm very excited for this event. I wanted to learn more about it, and they were hoping to have one of us who knew a lot about it, so I've been asked to informally sit with their uh, promotions and marketing team. So I'll be going to that meeting once a month, which I'm excited for. And the first thing that blew me away when I went to one was how professional this organization is. It is so, it's largely volunteer driven, but you sure wouldn't know it by sitting around that table and seeing the work that they're doing and how they're, approach, uh, how they're approaching it. I'm very confident it's going to be a great time. I know we got an email the other the other day to keep our calendar open for upcoming events. One specific thing that I was given the heads up that they're going to be asking council to do is if some of us would help with their ambassador program, which is as people show up in Grand Prairie, welcoming them as they arrive, saying, hey, welcome to Grand Prairie. We're so excited for you guys to be here. So that's a specific ask they're going to make, be making of us. I'm sure they'll be making a few others too, largely on that ambassador side. So I'm looking forward to being part of this great event for our community and for our province. Thanks very much, Councillor Bressy. We'll move to Councillor O'Toole. 
Thank you very much, Mayor Gibbon. Um, did a number of things this, uh, this last month, I guess you could say. We've been gone away for a while. But uh, just recently, I attended the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum. Uh, we also had uh, members from Council. Uh, um, Eunice Friesen was there, and uh, our public relations, David Olinger, was there as well, amongst another 110 other individuals that attended. We had uh, Robert Guest, uh, Fossil Country on Canvas, and I'm just going to read from this little brochure that they had. For those of you that don't know who Robert Guest was, uh, he passed away here a couple, last year. And Robert Guest was an acclaimed Canadian artist who was born in Beaver Lodge, Alberta. And in 1938, he grew up in the family home on the Wapiti River. From a young age, Guest had an avid interest in drawing, which, as a young man, led him to study art at the Alberta College of Art and Design. Uh, graduating in 1963, he subsequently graduated from the University of Alberta in 1974 with a Bachelor of Education, with distinction having majored in art education. Guest's uh, work reflects his passion for the wilderness and attempts to convey the feeling and mystery of specific places and times. His noctures, for which he became more widely known, captured the mood and nuance of the night. The group of seven, especially Tom Thompson, are cited as some of Robert's artistic influences. Robert's drawings and paintings have represented uh, in many exhibitions. They form part of a collection of both private citizens and public spaces in uh, North America and overseas, including the collection by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. All his works in this display, which is going on for a few more weeks at the Rob, uh, Sorry, all his works in this exhibit, Fossil Country on Canvas, uh, the Hinton Trail paintings of Robert Guest are on loan from a private collection of Dr. Camille Torby. A local resident of Grand Prairie, Dr. Torby came to know Guest through their mutual interest in art, and their two became friends. Dr. Torby subsequently purchased almost all of Guest's Hinton Trail works when they became available. Seventeen of these remarkable pieces were then chosen in the curation of this exhibit based on their proximity to the major paleontology, uh, major paleontological uh, fossil sites in the region. And some of those sites were, as mentioned, uh, the Pipestone Creek area, the Red Willow, the Pinto, uh, a little farther south, we got Kakwa uh, and Grand Cache and Hinton. So... Uh, with that, if you have an interest in art and if, uh, interest in dinosaurs, there's bones from the U of A, bones from the Drumheller, and the artwork from uh, Robert Guest. And that exhibition will be on for a few more weeks yet. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor Tool. Councillor Clayton. Apologies. Thank you that I attended in the last uh, little while, but I wanted to highlight an event that happened this weekend at uh, the Nighthawk Ski Hill. They had a celebration for families uh, to bring in, ring in the new year, and they had over a 1,000 people at that hill on the hill the day skiing, tubing, um, riding on the wagons and the horses, and it's not confirmed yet. I have a board meeting there this week, but uh, I think they broke a single-day record for attendance at the hill this weekend, so just wanted to highlight that. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Councillor Clayton. Councillor Minhas. Thank you very much, Will Mayor. <coughs> uh, I think everybody enjoyed the holidays during the Christmas, and hopefully everybody had looking for the Happy New Year. We had it better. We did uh, uh, been to the uh, Star Lottery opening day today, and I'd done a couple more things, but they were not minor. But that was the great thing. We do it with the um, um, revolution together and helpful. And also our manager, Lino, is a director for the star. So that helped a lot and to the people that if you listen to the story, you almost cry a lot of time. It's how the people survive and how much they do. So that was a very good cause. We went there today and uh, we do every year, but that was went there today me. That's about it today. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Councillor Minhas. Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, I was very impressed. Uh, um, Councillor O'Toole showed my daughter and me around uh, the museum a little bit and maybe into some areas that it helped to it helped to be on the board to get into. Uh, we really enjoyed that. But I have to say, at the uh, Philip J. Curry Museum, the Robert Guest display is phenomenal. It, it really uh, blew me away. I think it's such a brilliant thing that the that the museum has done out there. So it's there for another month, did you say? Is that Was that it? I, I, it seems to me it's a month at least, but uh, do get out there if you have the opportunity. And uh, in addition to the STARS lottery kickoff this afternoon, uh, I also attended the Rotary Dream Home opening day on the 29th of December. These are a couple of organizations that do great work uh, in our community and more broadly, STARS, of course, is uh, Alberta-wide and uh, Rotary has an international reach. Uh, but this is one of the local ro Rotary groups that does that. So a couple of uh, things to support in uh, in the next number of weeks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Councillor Platt. Thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, it was a pretty quiet last couple of weeks with Council Break for me. I had one event before Christmas with a tri-municipal uh, meeting out in Valley View. And it was nice to get together with, with the MD in the county and start to, to continue to work on forming a, a better relationship with that group. And, and I think there's a, a ton of potential out, uh, south of town and something hopefully that this region will benefit as a group. Uh, and it's something I'm looking forward to being part of for the next few years. Um, also, just uh, last week, I guess, the, it, it's not a standing committee for me, but I went to the Protective Services meeting and it brought back to me just yet again how much people are involved with our community. From picking up my kids from school to just stopping around the community, I, I've got a lot of people uh, talking about the fire hall RFP, so it's uh, you know bringing it to my attention what they thought and how we and what we should be doing with it. So I, I, I'm intrigued by how many people actually are engaged in our community because I always wonder if they actually read these things or watch what we're doing right now. So it was it was nice to to see that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Platt. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, it's hard to believe with as uh, the, as busy as we are that the last time we met was well before Christmas. And uh, here we are in the new year, and a number of things have gone on that uh, I've almost forgotten about already. But uh, one that sticks out in my mind is the unveiling of the commemorative photo mosaic, which took place um, at the Montrose Cultural Centre on the 29th of December. This is a remarkable piece of artwork and a great collaboration between a local artist and uh, the city in terms of the... Uh, um, collection of photos that were put together um, from our 150th year celebration. And so uh, it, it looks tremendous. It wasn't anything like I expected it to be when it was unveiled. And um, uh, kudos to everybody who was involved in the, the design and uh, in the actual concept of putting it together and putting it on display in a local pla uh, public place. Thanks very much, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I'm just going to speak to two things here. Um, actually, it's, for me, it's felt really slow. I was like kicking myself. I'm like, I got to go to this IPS meeting because I'm just got nothing else and I need something right now. I need to work. Uh, anyways, uh, I, I was kind of busy as it goes. Uh, but on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, the morning of New Year's Eve, I got a, received a phone call from uh, uh, Muskegee Park uh, as I was scheduled to uh, MC the entertainment. Uh, festivities for the evening, which is always a joyous affair. Unfortunately, it was uh, super cold, wind chills getting on minus 40, and for the first time ever, I heard cancel potentially the fireworks and, and the event altogether. Uh, horses were canceled, everything else was canceled, and uh, Carla Wells from Muskegee Park said, uh, I can't make this decision on my own, so I helped facilitate some, some conversations in between the city manager and the mayor, and myself, uh, somewhere in between there, somebody not named Chris Thiessen uh, made the decision to continue to go forward with the festivities for that night, which was a joyous affair. Uh, it was about 200 people showed up, which is a really small New Year's for Muskegee Park. Uh, but we didn't cancel the fireworks. We, we left them to the next day. And also being considerate of, I guess, people's work schedules and, and their opportunities to see the fireworks with their family, uh, the decision was made to 
shoot off the fireworks at 7 rather than at 10, which is what we typically do. And uh, from all accounts, I mean, I was helping a friend build a shop that day. Uh, but uh, we watched the fireworks from afar, and from all accounts out of Muskie Park, it was uh, as big a turnout as there ever is. And uh, I've talked with many residents, at least dozens, who were very appreciative that we didn't uh, cancel it. So to Mr. City Manager Bob Nicolay, to Bill, uh, thanks for being involved in that uh, discussion that uh, came to, I think, uh, probably the most palpable outcome that was good for everybody at the end, not just palpable. Uh, last thing I want to mention is uh, last week I took my son and one of his friends to the East Link Center for a swim, which is always a good time. Uh, and while I was getting ready to pull out my money and pay, I was told that uh, there's a promotion going on at the East Link Center right now, uh, which is, uh, you know, a free two weeks, uh, full facility uh, access for anybody that wants to sign up into the database. Uh, now, I didn't do it that day, but I thought it was a great idea. And I was actually looking around and I was like, where's the poster? Where's it telling me? And then it arrived in my mail. But in case you're one of the thousands of people out there, oh, there you are, uh, watching this uh, on the webcast, uh, two weeks, you sign up up until February 16th, you get two free weeks at the East Link Center, full facility access. I know we got the media in the room here too. You guys are going to cover that, make sure that uh, the citizens of Grand Prairie know, because this is free access. And not only that, it's also free advertising for the city because the way I look at it is once you're in our system, when we do a membership drive, we're going to call you. And if you like what you get at the East Link Center, maybe you'll come back year-round for more. So fe until February 16th, guys, we're going to make it happen. Yeah. Thanks very much, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of meetings that uh, I don't believe any other council members, well, no other council members were in attendance at. I had a delegation uh, come and visit me here at City Hall. Uh, Mr. Jerry McDonald is the president of the Alberta College and Association of Registered Nurses. Uh, Jerry is uh, local uh, to Grand Prairie, uh, but he's doing a, a couple year stint as the president of the uh, association uh, that represents registered nurses across the province and also the, uh, the uh, professional body uh, for the nursing practice. And so we had an opportunity to discuss issues of mutual concern. Um, I also had a alert board of directors teleconference on Thursday the 11th. Uh, the alert board right now is discussing some structural changes to the governance model for alert. Uh, the provincial government and the chiefs of police across the province and the alert board have been looking at uh, ways to involve the chiefs more directly so alert can be a bit more of a nimble organization. Uh, and uh, I think we've worked out a system uh, that seems to be acceptable to, to all. And so uh, over the coming weeks and months that's something that council and uh, the province will hear uh, the community will hear a little bit more about uh, and then finally i participated in a ribbon cutting at the new subway restaurant along resources road um, it's odd to think that there's a restaurant in this spot that has been empty for my entire life in grand prairie um, but uh, people will notice that uh, that intersection on resources road and 84th avenue um, is uh, is pretty busy right now with a starbucks uh, set to open shortly uh, the new uh, Circle K and gas station, a uh, lube shop coming in. And, and so it really is uh, filling out. And it was great to see the new concept of the uh, Subway store that opened there. It is the latest in the Subway franchise concepts. And so I'd encourage everybody to go and check it out. Uh, but great to see new businesses opening in Grand Prairie uh, and uh, new areas of our city developing and uh, increasing the tax base of the city, which is also a good thing too. Um, and with that, I don't believe I have anything else to report. And we'll call our meeting adjourned. Thank you.